Good. So, hi everybody. I'm Jason Hunt. I'm with IBM. Uh, I am the IBM representative on the ONAP TSC. And so I do want to talk today about DevOps. Um, you know, we heard from Catherine earlier that, you know, at and is looking to move to DevOps and continuous integration and continuous deployment. And so what does that mean, you know, when we talk about DevOps and how does ONAP enable that process? Um, so I'm going to kind of dive into that, compare ONAP against some DevOps, you know, methodologies and uh, tell you, you know, which components implement it and where there's some areas, you know, to, to, to grow. So I think we all kind of understand the problem, you know, that, you know, things like DevOps want to address, and that is time to market of our new network services, right? Today, you know, this process can literally take years, and it's not that there's one bottleneck along the way. It's in every step along the way, whether it's getting the network equipment, whether it's certifying and QAing that equipment, you know, whether it's deploying it out in, in, in the field or operating it, you know, all of those take a lot of time. And so what we're doing, trying to do with projects like ONAP is figure out how to reduce the time. And we can't just focus, for example, on one area like deployment. You know, we have to be able to look at the whole life cycle to be able to drill that down. So we've been saying that the network is moving towards software. Uh, so, you know, what can we learn, you know, from the software world that we can apply to, you know, this transformation? So at IBM, you know, we've done a lot of work in, in taking applications, traditional, you know, IT-like applications, transforming, transforming them into microservices uh, and making them cloud native and deploying them on the cloud. Uh, you know, we've done that with hundreds of clients. And so we actually came up with a methodology for that. This is a published methodology. You can go out to that, that link um, and see this. There's practice papers and all that behind it. Um, and so I thought this might be a good... Uh, reference, if you will, to bounce against ONAP and say, what, you know, how does ONAP meet some of these characteristics? And this covers everything from when you first think about planning what your service or application is going to be all the way through the development of it to testing it and deploying it to monitoring it to getting feedback from the customer about how you change and, and adapt that service. So that uh, methodology drills down into a reference DevOps architecture. Good news is I am not going to cover all 20 little dots on this slide, uh, but I, I will make the offer. If you want me to dive down deeper at a different time, I'd be happy to do that. Instead, I'm going to focus on kind of these core uh, practice areas around, around the edge here and drill down on each one of those. So if we look at the think area, for example, this is you know, when you're first planning what would go into a network service or something like that. You know, admittedly, this is an area that's probably outside of ONAP's scope to some extent, you know, uh, how, how, does, how does an operator go about deciding what network services to deploy, what's the customer experience going to be like for, you know, the user, the end user, all those sorts of things. There are some inputs from ONAP, so, uh, you know, VNF requirements, you know, help feed the requirements space here. Uh, there's some capabilities within service design and creation. Um, but what I have, and just as reference for all of these, is I'll have kind of the ONAP projects that fit. I've got some integrations about uh, you know, what systems you might have to integrate to. And then opportunities is areas where maybe you know, ONAP could grow into or other uh, folks might bring capabilities. So from an integration perspective in this phase, you, know, you might look at how are you doing your project planning and all of that today. And if you haven't already sort of merged your software, you know, your traditional IT software development groups and your network development groups, you know, it might be a good idea to be thinking about that and put, putting them on common tooling so that they're using the same tooling to, to define the requirements, to, to plan the releases, and all of that. If we move to the code phase, um, you know, this, this left part here is kind of what's defined in the reference architecture. But what's a little different about NFV is that a lot of the code is coming from, you know, a vendor. It's coming, the VNFs are coming in you know, from other sources. So I added, you know, for today's presentation, this obtain, you know, piece, which is how do you identify and validate and certify and onboard, you know, the code that you're going to bring in to your network service. Uh, and the good thing is ONAP has a lot of capabilities here. We're going to hear from Eric next exactly about how ONAP does that. So a lot of these projects, VNF SDK, the VNF validation program, uh, all of those play into there. On the code side of it, you know, we'd be looking at service design and creation to help construct what that service looks like. It has artifact management. 
you know, in it. It has, you know, processes in place to, to kick off testing, et cetera. But there's going to be a lot of integration you have to do in this phase uh, of a DevOps methodology. And so that would be integrations into the labs that do certification or into the network testing tools. Uh, again, you'll want to tie into your software development management tools to be able to do things like defect tracking, uh, to be able to feed those defects back in, make sure they're addressed in the process. So areas that I see for opportunities for ONAP in this space would be around that test automation. So being able to spin up you know, the VNF uh, automatically, maybe even spin up the whole you know, ONAP test bed automatically. Uh, spin up the, the testers, automatically kick off the testing, gather the test results, identify the defects, automatically open the defects. All of those are things that you know, I think uh, could be added into you know, this phase uh, of the, the, the code phase, if you will, of a methodology. The next piece is deliver, right? And this is the core, right? This is the core uh, kind of, of ONAP. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of this already in Chris's presentation, whether this is the, the service orchestrator talking to the controllers, various controllers, the common controller SDK that helps all the controllers do this, the active and available inventory that keeps track of everything that you've spun up, you know, in this case, uh, or the microservice bus that makes sure that all these components can talk to each other. Um, so as far as getting that network service out there, out into the runtime space, you know, a lot of great capabilities within ONAP uh, to do that. Uh, you'll, you'll have to integrate, of course, to your NFVI to do that. If you've got third-party VNF managers, you'll have to have some integration uh, parts there. And as Chris mentioned earlier, if you've got physical network functions, you're going to have to integrate to those pro you know, legacy provisioning systems uh, in, in this space. Areas for opportunity here that come out of some of these DevOps best practices. One is this area of uh, AB deployment. It also has similar concepts if you've heard of blue-green deployments or canary deployments. This is the idea that you know, as you roll out a new uh, release of a virtual function or perhaps a, um, a service, you can spin up just a little instance of it, drive a little test tra traffic to it, or maybe just put a couple customers on it see how it performs. If it performs well, maybe you add a couple more instances, and then eventually, you know, the whole release is deployed out there, while at the same time you're shrinking kind of the, the, the previous release. Um, so that's kind of a best practice, and it would be nice to, to get that uh, into the ONAP space. And then maybe even things like using policy, not just for closed-loop control, but also for your deployments. So, Maybe you have a policy around security that says, I should automatically deploy, for instance, a virtual firewall you know, with my service, even if that virtual firewall isn't modeled in the service itself. The policy would drive you know, some of the provisioning of, of you know, firewalls or maybe probes for operations or those sorts of things. From a runtime standpoint, um, you know, this is all where the cloud comes into, space, in, into play. So the multi-vim cloud, you know, project that Chris mentioned earlier, that's going to really enable operators to take advantage of different hypervisors, different clouds, whether those are private or public uh, clouds. Um, and then, you know, ONAP itself has to run somewhere, so the ONAP operations manager um, uh, project is working on how do you deploy ONAP on a, uh, for instance, the Kubernetes environment. And then I put application authorization framework project in here too because security is listed in here. Of course, really security has to apply throughout the whole uh, life cycle, um, but we had to have some place to put it. Uh, so you have to integrate with the NFVI here as well. Um, you will need some security tooling integration, right? There's no built-in threat detection or SSO with an ONAP. You're going to have to uh, figure out those integrations. Um, and then, of course, the legacy PNF infrastructure is going to be you know, side by side with your uh, with your VNFI as well. The key opportunities to, you know, enhance DevOps, if you will, for ONAP in this space uh, is, you know, the move to containers. We've heard this multiple times in, in, in different presentations uh, this week. So starting at the control plane, uh, ONAP itself, as I mentioned, the OOM project is already going down that road. Uh, but, you know, can we do this for VNFs as well? Can, and, you know, the goal here would be, can we get the network world to catch up or maybe even leapfrog what's happening in the rest of, you know, the IT and software world. So once you've got things out there and running, you have to manage them, of course. Uh, again, this is another very strong area within ONAP. So that's started, first of all, by the DCAE project. It's collecting all that data at all the different levels, you know, within the environment. 
from the hardware up through the virtual machines, up through the services itself. And then you can plug in an analytics on top of that. And so that might be homes uh, to do correlation. That's one of the things that could be plugged in there. Um, then you know, when it detects that something goes wrong, you've got the policy framework piece that says what action do you take to remediate uh, the fault or whatever it might be happening. Uh, all of that's the finding clamp. Clamp probably actually belonged up in the code space because that's a design time component. Uh, and then you use things like ANAI and the orchestrator and the controllers to take action uh, on that closed loop. Interesting things to think about here is, you know, how do you integrate with your existing OSSs? If you do, or you know, at what point do you want to do that? If the closed loop runs fine, maybe you don't integrate at all. If there's a situation you run across that can't be addressed, you know, with uh, with the closed loop, maybe that's the point that you, you know, you raise a ticket or an alert, you know, within your existing systems. You might also think about how do you integrate some of these newer cloud monitoring and eventing tools. Uh, so that might be things like New Relic or PagerDuty or Slack or something like that. That's the way a lot of these DevOps teams like to be notified of issues and figure out how to address those quickly. The biggest opportunity you heard, even though Arpit said, you know, hold on earlier, was around machine learning. Right? So the, the closed loop control I mentioned is typically what we call sort of reactive operations. You see that something's wrong or something needs to be addressed. You know, you've got a policy to deal with that and you take care of it. You can use that same closed loop control to do, you know, sort of proactive operations. Uh, so you could apply machine learning to the data that's coming out of DCAE, do some predictions and say, you know, I'm seeing a trend here that's just not quite right. I want to take, you know, I want to take some action ahead of time before anything actually goes wrong, before there's any service degradation. And so I'm going to do proactive operations using that same closed loop control uh, and feed that in there. So being able to plug in some of those machine learning pieces is important to move along this line, along proactive operations and automated operations. You know, getting even to things like being able to, to learn from you know, documents and other trouble tickets and, and all of that and, and figure out the best course of action to take. I also put in here consolidated logging and distributed tracing. This is actually an area that we've uh, tentatively have slated for release two so that across the ONAP components we understand what's happening uh, where and can troubleshoot those. Uh, the last one in this circle here is learn. And this isn't the learn like the operations that I just mentioned. This is learning about how the service itself is being used in the environment and what it means uh, to the business. So the good news again is that ONAP can help enable this because it's collecting all kinds of great data about the services and how they're being used. So that can come up through DCAE, how it's configured and how many instances of things are out there are, are available in the ANAI system. But what you probably want to do is you want to combine that with other data that you have. Maybe that is uh, information out of your CRM systems, uh, you know, about customers that have called in and how they're dealing with things. Or maybe it's social media data. You know, you look at uh, what people are saying about that new service and, and how it's been rolled out. And if you feed all that into maybe your big data infrastructure, you know, your business analyst can come up with some insights that says, oh, you know, uh, the virtual uh, residential CPE, for example. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of customers are using that parental controls, but they're having trouble, you know, getting it configured just right. That's what I saw on social media. So maybe if I made a tweak, you know, to that feature of the service, you know, I could sell more of it. And that kicks off this whole life cycle again because it feeds back into this whole tracking and business planning process. So, you know, if we look at that process, we can say, yeah, we can deliver Network services faster. I mean, that's, that's the goal we're trying to get to with DevOps. And you know, one of the opportunities to do that is automating you know, that testing and certification process. We can balance the speed, cost, quality, and risk out there by you know, enhancing our operations uh, to be more cognitive, applying machine learning and AI to it. And we can reduce the time you know, to customer feedback by taking all that data that's coming out of ONAP and applying some analytics to it and understanding the behavior of the customers. And of course, we want all that on a dynamic cloud infrastructure that can run in a number of different places. So a quick plug on the IBM side, we've got a bunch of demos downstairs. If you want to see one on ONAP, it's uh, running on the IBM cloud. So that feeds into kind of that test phase I talked about. Maybe you want to spin up uh, an ONAP instance to be able to, to do some testing. You can do that there. We've got a little bit on the, uh, the cognitive operations side as well. 
All right, last thing I want to cover, this is a little different topic here. So this weekend after I go home back to the US, uh, on Sunday I'm participating in something called a Tough Mudder. Um, now, if you don't know what a Tough Mudder is, it's, it's an event where you go out and you run, you get a team of folks together, you go out and run about 10 or 12 miles. Every half mile there's an obstacle. Uh, and it might be something like, you know, jump in a bunch of mud pits. Uh, it might be run through a bunch of live wires. That's called electroshock therapy. Um, or it might be, you know, climbing this thing that they call Everest, right? And so I'm a little nervous about this. Like I said, I've never done this. So I try to figure out how am I going to get through this thing on Sunday. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what I've learned from working with ONAP and the open source community to get through it. Let me tell you how. So first of all, I know I'm going to get dirty. And that happens in open source. If you're going to participate, you know, you're going to get dirty. It's messy. It's not a clean process. There's not always agreement about this is how we do it. And, you know, it doesn't always fit the timeline. So, so I'm going to get dirty doing it. Um, but the other thing I've learned from open source is that if the different companies and the different participants in the companies work together, you know, we can achieve some pretty cool things. So when it comes to this Everest, for example, you know, I'm going to rely on my teammates, but not just my teammates, everybody there is going to help get people over the wall. You know, this isn't a timed event. It's not a competition. We're working together. So, you know, there's a guy here that's standing on somebody else's shoulders and somebody else pulling him over the top. Um, so I'm going to try to take those lessons and hopefully get through the Tough Mudder without too many scars. Um, I know it's a little bit of motherhood and apple pie, but uh, that's, that's kind of where I think you know, things like open source and ONAP uh, come into play and, you know, hopefully we can all work together and more of you will, will join us in that effort. So, thank you. All right. Thanks, Jason. I'm not going to shake your hand. It looks muddy already. So, <laughs> uh, but, but this is excellent. Any questions for Jason? I know there's a lot of carriers. So, you know, any lessons learned or hard Questions are, are free. We have a couple of minutes. We can do it. Yeah. Uh, wait. Please wait for the mic. Right there. So this is a very interesting introduction about this uh, process and uh, culture transformation. But uh, reminding of us is that still related to people. So you didn't talk too much about the people, about your very detailed that yeah. process. So in case of so man, so detailed the process, how the people being involved? Does you need more people? So you you need less people? How the division and the people be related? Yeah. I, I'd like you elaborate a detail. You know, you're very you're very observant because you know if we flip back here, right in the center of this was culture, and I was afraid I wasn't going to have time to talk about it because it's such an important topic. Um, you know, but it's a very detailed topic. So, uh, you know, being able to uh, influence folks, uh, encourage them to build new skills. I mean, I know at at and Catherine can probably talk about it. She touched on it a little bit. You know, they've done a, a lot to transform their folks, to enable them, to give them online learning, all of that. So, you know, you really have to make an investment in your people and reskilling your people, you know, in order for this to happen. And, and, and so it, it does change how they have to think, and it is challenging. Uh, but uh, definitely, that's, that's the heart of it all. That's why they put a heart there. So. Yeah, and I think just on, uh, speaking on behalf of at and publicly they have stated uh, that over 1,000 folks were retrained um, in terms of six-month courses, deep dive, you know, basically, you know, conversion of network admins to developers, right? Now, not everybody can code, and not everybody needs to code, right? I mean, Python and scripting is not really code. I mean, we can do it, okay? So uh, it doesn't have to be like Java and all that, right? So, so there's, there's things that people have done over time that, that, uh, that are useful, and I think that's a transformation. Uh, there are plenty of papers and videos on that as well if you want to look at it, but that's an important yep. uh, aspect. Very good. Thank you, Jason.